Hello and welcome to 6502 Assembly Language Programming. I believe this will be part 11. Uh, I think it's part 4 of working on our game of life here. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, you can get the other videos if you haven't. If this is the first one you've seen, you get them from these locations on my blog, um, under the programming tag, or at my BitChute channel. Alright, so the thing we wanted to start with, um, the thing I was trying to figure out last time when we quit, was how to um, how to do a uh, press a key to continue sort of thing. And I was looking for the memory location for the keyboard, and that's what I would spend about 10 minutes on and down. So I found it um, later afterwards, and it's a D4 in zero page. Um, if you look at the zero page map here, uh, the memory map for the Commodore 128. I think it's probably different on the 64, but it's called, and I even said it last time as I was looking through these and didn't realize I was looking at it, but it's called the Key Scan Current Key Index at uh, location D4. And what that, what that is is um, 60 times a second, there's a chip, uh, one of the CIA chips, um, I think that stands for Complex Interface Adapter, I think. Um, scans the keyboard and puts whatever key you're pressing, if you're pressing anything, puts it in that memory location. So that happens 60 times a second. And um, what it puts there isn't like the isn't the same as like the screen value of a key because you know your key the way your keyboard is laid out, it's in it's in a grid, and so things have it sort of seems sort of random as far as what the value of each key is and then the operating system if you act, if you ask the operating system for a key it translates those values um, and gives you the the ASCII value or Petsky value we call it on Commodore um, when you read it from this memory location directly you get the raw um, key scan um, that's why they call it the key index it's an index into a table of um, keys or of characters. Now we don't actually care what key is pressed because we're just going to do a press any key sort of thing. Um, but to demonstrate that, if we look at, let's, let's see, let's blow this up a little bit, see how this works. In the Commodore 128 here, in the Commodore 128 emulator here, I wrote a little two-line program which peaks for peaks the value of that location and then just goes loops back and does that again so if we run that you see that it's showing 88 over 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 and over and over and if i press a key like if i press d then it shows 18. if i press a it shows 10 w shows 9 q shows 62 return shows one and so it's just checking that location over and over as fast as it can in basic which isn't terribly fast and so what you can do then is you if you check that location and it holds 88 that means there's no key being pressed and then as soon as it as soon as there's a key pressed it, then it changes to something else and so we can use that to um, do what we need to do so let me shrink that back down Okay, so in our code then, we come down to the end of the turn, and basically right here before jump back to take turn, before we jump back to the top, we want to put this, we want to put in some code to do that. So we'll just call it, we'll, we'll make a subroutine call get a key. I won't call it wait for key because it doesn't wait. It just checks what's in there right now. Um, that's one difference between um, checking the memory location versus asking the um, asking the kernel for a key. You can the the kernel has a routine that will wait for the next key to be pressed. We don't want to do that. We just want to um, as soon as the key is pressed, we want to go on. So we'll come down here. Um, what do we call it? Get a key. comment um, I 
Actually, we do want to call it wait for key, don't we? For a key to be pressed. Because we're not just going to get what's in there. We're going to get... We do want to wait for a key to be pressed. So to do that, we want to load A from location D4. Compare it to 88, which is um, 58 in hexadecimal. Branch if equal back up to wait for key and otherwise return. Okay, so what this is going to do is it's going to get the value out of that memory location, compare it to the value that means nothing is being pressed, and if that's the case, it's going to branch back up here and do it again. So basically, this is just going to go, once it gets to wait for key, it's just going to go into a loop until we press a key, and then it'll hit this return, come back up here, and go on to the next turn. All right, so... Assemble. Load it. Okay, so it should be waiting for our key press now after it went through the, the whole process once. So I'll press a key. Oh, sorry, I gotta press it in the machine, not in the M, not in the monitor. There it goes. Okay, now it's going to wait for another press. And another one. And another one. Okay. The reason for this was there seemed to be some locations that weren't working. Um, and I don't know why. For instance, let me blow this up again. This heart right here, I don't know if my, let's see, put my pointer, let's see, this heart right here is staying alive even though it shouldn't. It's It's got no neighbors and so it should die on the next turn. So let me press this, press a key. It's still alive. This one also, let's see, right here next to it should also die. And they're not, those aren't dying. For some reason, certain locations are staying alive when they shouldn't. No, oh, yeah, I ran out of turns. Okay, let's uh, start again. Whoop. Oop. <laughs> that was weird. Hmm. Yeah, there are certain memory locations. If those are actually stable, no, those aren't stable because some of these, like these pairs of hearts right here, should die. Actually, I think it's just stuck. Let's see. I wonder why I'm getting a full screen of hearts instead of instead of them showing up randomly. That's weird. I don't recall changing anything that would be causing that. Hmm. Let's reset. Okay, so now I watch for, I'm just kind of watching, because a lot of these hearts, like this heart right here, 
is alone now it should die this over this one should die this one should die this one along the side over here should die um, okay so I'm gonna watch this one right here no well, it died okay gotta find one that doesn't when it should and there's some up here most of these should die off and they did okay. alright there's one right there that didn't and still didn't and then it broke okay <clears throat> So I have certain locations that don't seem to be working quite right. Let's see. I need to find one of those locations early enough. Either that or I need to expand the number of turns. Okay, there's two, two hearts right down here that are alone. And they're still alive. So I need to figure out where those are in memory, I guess. Um, See, that's going to be They're on the sixth row from the bottom. I have to do a little figure in here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we got 25 rows, so 25, 24, 23, 22, 21. That's row 20. And it looks like that's position 3. And position six. So if we do a little math, we've got 19 rows times 40 plus three. That'd be 763. Um, let's put that. Let's put that in hex. Two FB, and our screen starts at four hundred, so that's going to be at six FB. Uh, let's see. Let's check just that two F eight. Okay, so let's check at four F eight. Okay. So we have, I might be a little off on my calculation there. I'm showing a heart in the fifth position and the eighth position. And then Oh, you know what? I think I'm counting. I think I counted the rows wrong. I think there's 25 rows, but they're they'd be one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's yeah, 19 rows above that. We've got two hearts. Yep. 
two in the very first row we've got two hearts and then five spaces and then two hearts and then two spaces and that looks right if we go to the second row add 40 to that 40 in hexadecimal is two eight so four two eight then we've got a heart a space a heart yep okay so 19 rows should be and 19 times 40 what am I not thinking right I'm not thinking right I'm thinking something wrong here what is it um, Oh, there it is. Oh, I, I think I forgot to add the 200. <clears throat> okay, so we have 53. We have a heart in the third spot, and then a heart in the sixth spot, like I said. And then not one until you get about 20 spots over or something like that. <clears throat> All right, then looking at the same place in the work area at two, that starts at 2,000. <clears throat> We have a zero basically ones and zeros. So the question would be why is that one not getting changed? Why are those are those particular two? Why are they not getting changed? Um it is probably going to be something to do with the way I'm walking through the board. I think I'm not quite hitting the whole board. Um, that's going to be my guess. It's probably a looping problem. Um, because, yeah, those should those should be going, you know, those should go away on the next turn, and they're not. Now, there are some, when you get further over on that line, you get into some that do have more neighbors. Um, let's see. <clears throat> If I look at the very first line, we've got two neighbors, and then three, and then two, and yeah. And so, yeah, that, that makes sense. Let me see here. 2, 2, F, A. Just make sure I'm looking at the right thing. Yeah, the third position, the, the heart at the third position in the 19, or the 20th line has no neighbors, but it, the, the two next to it each have a neighbor, and then the same thing with the one at the six. They each have one neighbor because they, they're on either side of it. But for some reason, it is not getting, for some reason, those two are not getting uh, redone, I guess she could say. They're not, uh, they're not getting handled for some reason. So, um, let's think about this a bit. So when we're coming through the board... It's, it's figuring the neighbors right. I guess that's the stuff that checks all the neighbors. That's fine. What's not getting done is it's not replacing all the hearts like it's supposed to. So let's think about this. Let's think through this part right here. We're loading a from the location in working memory. Comparing it to two, that would not be the case. This would be this one would be a zero. Um, in fact, I'm going to go. Let me go back over to the and just hit it one more time. Okay, I've got to Yeah, they're still there. Okay. All right. So, and if I check them again. Still zeros. 
but yeah, they're not getting they're not getting changed in the screen memory for some reason. So why is that? It's comparing to two. It would branch be equal, but it's not equal. So compares to three. Branches if not equal to dead. Loads A with 20. Stores that. So it's not it's not getting there for some reason. So that's the question. Why isn't it getting there? Um, my first thought is that it has something to do with my loops that I'm not... Remember, this is where we did the... Um, where no, this no, we don't have the. We're not doing any. Well, yeah, this is where we do the um, the self-modifying code. So let's look at the code. And find this spot. Okay, so there's the load A from the start of working memory, comparing to two, branching, da 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 da. Okay, and then here we start our loops. We loop it on Y and then lo looping on X. Um, load A from working memory, compare it to 2, and then compare it to 3. I don't, it shouldn't change anything. Yeah, that should be okay. It shouldn't, um, comparing doesn't, doesn't change A. It just sets flags. Um, the fact that it's working on almost all the cells and just certain ones, it's not. And I noticed those two the other day, the last time I was working on this too, it seemed like those two cells were not uh, changing, which is just odd. Um, <clears throat> it's got to be fascinating to just watch me do this. Um, and then store it, and then... Well, let's see. If we want to put seven hundred sixty three, we're looping through two hundred and fifty times times four. That's the that's the thousand times. I'm just wondering if I'm not getting the complete 250, although that's that really that wouldn't explain why two of them, three apart, are a problem. I could have a one-off error, but that wouldn't give you a three-off error. Um,
well, what I can do, we can set a break at, let's see, we'll put it at, um, I guess we'll just put it at the start of the loop. So we'll put it at the load A, we'll put it at 1391, and we can break on Y equals to, if Y equals 1. I think that's, or how do you do that, I guess. Whoops. Oh, if, that's right. Um, how you did it. Oh, got to have two two equals. That makes sense. No doubt. Yay, finally worked. Let's see, do I have any other breakpoints? No. Alright. So we want to, we're gonna break if y equals one. And that should be on the fourth roll through, which is where we want because our the two that we're looking at are after the, the third turn through. They're in the fourth section of the screen, so let's try that. Okay, we stopped, <clears throat> and it's been advanced from where it started at 1F to 22FF, so that's correct, that's what we want. Let's see what the code looks like now. So yeah, we're, we're checking the work area now from 22FF and up, and we're storing them at 6FF and up, so that's correct. Um, I don't think there's any. I don't think anything else has been tampered with here. Everything looks right. So now let's see what's at 6F8. We've still got our hearts there at the third and sixth point, the third and sixth spots, and then we've still got zeros there. So. <clears throat> Alright, so if I, right now, what is X? Okay, this is, oh, it's going to be working backwards across the screen, so let me think here. Um... Delete five, and then let's set that again to break if x is equal to 20, and then return. Okay. All right, so x is down to 20 now, which means it's going to be loading from 22 ff. Now wait a second. Maybe we're not in the fourth section of the screen. Or maybe I'm just not thinking right here. Okay, 1F, 2, 0, 2, 1, and 22. So 22 FF is the fourth section of the screen. But I guess my hearts aren't in the fourth section of the screen because they're at 2, 8, 22 8 or 22 F 8 
not FF. Is that where I, is that my problem? That's my problem. Yeah. Okay. Figured it out. <laughs> the screen is a thousand bytes, but one K is a thousand twenty four bytes. So by by moving my page when we did the self uh, self modifying code what i'm doing is shifting the work area and the screen area 256 bytes each time even though i'm only working on 200 even though i'm only looping through 250 bytes each time that's the mistake there um okay so what i need to do Yeah, because I me mean, the easy thing is to just do all one is to do a whole full is to do a full K, just do a thousand twenty four bytes. Um and let twenty four bytes go past the end of the screen. It it doesn't hurt anything because the computer the computer sees the full one K as available for the screen anyway, even though the screen only needs a thousand bytes instead of ten twenty four. Um if we make that zero that's it's going to fix it um where's my there, there's my decrement x and so the first time it decrements it it'll de it'll decrement it down to i just want to make sure that it's going to get every one it could inc let's let's make it increment that's going to feel better um oops let's increment x because that way okay so the first time it'll have x equal to zero that way it'll be working left to right it'll if i need to check something i won't have to work backwards um so it'll increment it and then branch if not equal so the first time yeah it'll branch because it's one and then so on so i believe that will fix my bug and that's why so basically it was not doing three sections on the screen of six three six byte sections on the screen it was not doing that was one of them there was another one up and so like it was screen locations 251 to 256 and then 501 to 506 750 yeah, 751 to 756, and that was what we're hitting there on the third one. Um, and that was... Uh, that was weird. Break. All right. So now, let's see what happens here. If I see anything jumping out at me that should be dying that isn't. Uh, I guess it got, what did I, I guess I only allowed 10, 10 turns. Yeah. Let's just give it 32 turns. Now that I'm paging through anyway. Okay, they seem to be dying out, as they should. We're getting down to, let's see, like these, like a two by two square is stable because each one has three neighbors. Um, a one by three section is stable, but it'll switch back and forth. It'll go, um, It'll go horizontal, and then it'll go vertical, and then it'll go horizontal, and then vertical. 
this like 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 this right here my pointer actually my pointer is kind of weird I can't make my pointer go everywhere on the uh, plus I've been shoot I didn't realize I had this covering so much for you guys you probably couldn't see everything I was doing in the monitor sorry about that um well, let's make it bigger for now. Um, I'll just have to remember to shrink it down again later. So one by threes like these are stable, but they'll switch back and forth from horizontal to vertical. Pairs will disappear, or they should. And then these other, and then like these two here should disappear. So we'll see what happens. Yep, they did. Okay. It's kind of interesting because once you get, sometimes certain shapes will move across the screen and then they'll hit other stable stable shapes and uh, like knock them loose sort of. Yeah, this like this little, this circle up here towards the top is, is stable. Each one has two neighbors. Nope. And I got to the end. Let's um Give it 255 turns so I can let it run long enough to be sure. see any lone hearts surviving anymore which is the main thing um, they do they do seem to be dying off as they're supposed to <clears throat> and that's what usually happens with it is you get Areas either die off or they grow larger and run into each other, and then different things happen. Not, uh, I'm, I'm obviously not scrutinizing all these patterns to see if they should be doing what they're doing, but just glancing at it, it seems like they are. Um, cells that should die from being alone are definitely dying. Now, cells that are crowded, they're too crowded, yeah, they're, they're dying off too. So I think, um, and we, I mean, we tested that pretty well earlier, I think, looking, just looking at the work area and seeing that the numbers were doing what they needed to do. Um, it was just a question of, they yeah, see there, a whole bunch of, a bunch of stuff ran into each other on the right side of the screen and, and uh, died out. get those diamond shapes and then they turn into a bunch of one by threes you 
guess I can just hold the key down because it's as soon as it checks then there's one waiting Should be about finished here. Hey, and we're down to a stable, a stable arrangement, and, and they were just happened to get done. So, all right. So I think it works. I think it all works. Um, that's what it appear. It appears to work. So the next question is, you know, obviously, what do you do next? Well, I was thinking about refactoring. Refactoring, if you're not familiar with the term, is basically when you take a working program and try to make it better. Um, debugging is when you look for bugs, you know, things that are wrong. Refactoring just means, okay, it works, but can we, you know, can we improve it? Can we make it faster or smaller or whatever, you know, more useful? Um, that kind of thing. So, one possibility for refactoring would be, I was, I was thinking about how the way I did the um, calculating of the spaces was probably not the best, not the most efficient way. Um, let me go back up here. Let me move the screen out of the way. Looking at the code here, to do the to, to figure the neighbors for each cell, I go through the x and y coordinates. You know, moving moving across the, or I guess actually it's down. It was going down each column. It doesn't really matter. But anyway, going through each cell based on x and y coordinates, figuring out from the x and y coordinates the cell's location in um, screen memory and work memory, which takes a bit of math. You know, that's this x y to cell. Um, routine, which is down here somewhere. And there's a fair amount of stuff going on here, you know, in this routine. And that's got to be called for every location. You know, I'm going through the board. Um, I'm going, since I'm going through, since I'm starting with the coordinates and working to the memory location, I've got to figure the memory location so I can look at it and see is this cell alive. I only need to I only need to actually do anything with the live cells, but I still have to do that calculation with every one so that I can then look at its, you know, I can see whether it's alive and then if it is alive, then I've got to look at the neighbors. And so you've got to call XY to cell a thousand times even if you only have, you know, 20 live cells. So I got to thinking about that, and I think that is the only place I call it. Or no, actually, I have to call it in an increment neighbor as well. Yeah, and then that's, and then if a cell is alive, then I call it eight more times because I've got to find the the memory location for each of its eight neighbors. Um, and so. Just look at that thinking, okay, how did I do that? Um, okay, yeah. So I was thinking about that. And I thought that is really not probably the most efficient way to do that because if I didn't, if instead of going X and Y and figuring out the memory location, if I just walked through the thousand memory locations, I would only have to calculate things for each cell that's actually alive. I could just immediately ignore the dead cells. And then when I got to a live cell, I'd have to figure out, okay, which eight locations, or a maximum of eight locations, are this cell's neighbor? Well, that's actually not as tricky as you might think when you stop and think about it. Um, let's, uh, let's make a little grid here. Okay, that didn't work very well. Uh, 
Um, sorry, just getting kind of setting things up here. Okay, in the middle here, we've got A. Let's, let's say that's the cell we're looking at. We, we start skimming through the memory locations. We come to a cell that's alive, and it's in memory location A. Okay, A might be, let's say A is 433. It doesn't matter what it is, but let's say that's its memory location. We found a live cell. Well, the locations of its eight neighbors then we can actually figure with math we don't need to figure x and y we can just say okay the one above it is a minus 40 because there's 40 memory locations in each line and then up and to its left would be a minus 41 and then we've got a minus 39 this one's pretty easy this is just a minus 1 a plus 1. Then down here we'd have a plus 40, a plus 41, and a plus 39. So we can actually find all eight neighbors without figuring, okay, we've got to multiply by 40, you know, without working back or backwards or forwards, however you want to look at it. We don't need to deal with x and y coordinates at all if we just use this math, if we just add and subtract. That's simple enough. The tricky part comes in with what if you're on the what if you're on an edge? What if you're on the top edge, the bottom edge, or a side? Because then that's gonna throw things off. You don't want unless you actually want to wrap around, which wasn't what you know wasn't my plan, and I don't want to do that just because it's easy and just because you're you know it's lazy. Um so you would have to you're going to have to add some checks to say okay are we on the top edge of the screen because then if we are we don't mess with these top three neighbors because they aren't there they don't actually exist and if you're on the bottom edge of the screen you don't mess with these three the bottom three neighbors and if you're on the left edge of the screen you don't mess with these three and you know if you're on the right edge of the screen you don't mess with these three and then the question is how are you going to know if you're on the edge of the screen well, what we can do is as we're going through the lines, instead of what I'm thinking is, thinking in terms of pseudocode here, um, you could say 4y in 1 to 25, because you've got 25 lines, 4x in 1 to 40, Okay, or well, let's say zero. To, let's let's keep it simple here. Zero to twenty-four and zero to thirty-nine. Then we need to. Then you know you're going to step through memory, but you can still be even though we're not using the x and y to calculate like we did before, we can still use them just to know where we are. So if, at, if y is 0, we know we're on the first line, and we can skip over the checks for these first three neighbors. Um, if x is 0, I don't know why I put a 3 there. If x is 0, we know we're on the left side of the screen, the left edge, and we could ignore the left side neighbors, and so on. So that's an idea to refactor it. Um, I'm not going to start that right now because that's going to be a fair bit of work and I'm already up to 50 minutes on this one. Um, but I'm thinking that can actually make things quite a bit faster and I don't know if it'll make the code any smaller, but it can eliminate all this calculating um, from X and Y to memory locations and you know simplify that, that stuff somewhat. Because, um, like I said, we're you know we're doing that a thousand times 
every time through every turn we're doing that a thousand times plus eight times for every cell that's alive and that's really it's quite a bit of calculating because every time you've got to take y times 40 plus x um, which like I said this this xy to cell routine is fairly long and so that's a lot of stuff to be calling that often and we can eliminate that entirely um, and I think you know it's gonna make this part a little more complicated because instead of just jump well yeah so we won't be messing with because ink ink neighbor calls that so that's the eight times for each cell that's alive you're um, you're calling that we won't have ink neighbor anymore exactly well we'll have ink neighbors and it'll just do the it'll do the eight by by doing this stuff by doing subtract 41 subtract 40 subtract 39 subtract 1 add 1 add 39 and just do the do the eight neighbors that way because adding and subtracting is just a heck of a lot faster than multiplying um, and so we can eliminate some extra work that way so that's going to be the plan um, I guess for next time I wasn't sure whether to work on this any longer or to move on to another project um, I did get some comments which is really nice to know that people are are getting something out of these um, and it's not just uh, not just me rambling um, or maybe it is just me rambling but it's still useful so um, if you have an opinion um, certainly let me know what you'd like me to work on next or if you have any ideas or you know if you like that idea of, of refactoring this thing um, I will probably if not if not the next time we'll probably do that at some point um, another idea I had was to go on to a, a classic program called 10 print which is a one-line basic program that builds a maze um, out of random numbers and I thought that would be a a fairly simple thing, a little simpler than this, that I thought could probably be done in one video um, and would show show some interesting things. So um, might move on to something like that. Um, another possibility is there are a lot of um, text-based games that are avail that come in a package on FreeBSD called BSD games. A lot of old um, Snake and Rogue and um, robots and just different text-based um, games that uh, I think would be you know manageable to write in a few hours of uh, videos like this so I might tackle um, something like that coming up pretty soon too so um, so I got a little darker here while I was doing this um, hopefully you can still see me there so anyway um, I guess that's going to be it for this time, and I'll be back next time to either refactor this thing or move on to another project. And if you have any um, comments or uh, suggestions for next time, be sure to leave them uh, somewhere in the comments, either at BitChute or YouTube or wherever this ends up, or, or drop me an email. Um, let's see. My email is Aaron at Baher. Dot biz. So you can always reach me that way too. Alright, so that'll be it for this time, and thanks for watching.